afternoon, everyone. I'm assuming this is on. Yeah, you just got to talk loud. Okay, I'll talk loud. Um, first, wanted to just start with a. Uh, it's, uh, I was just outed that I'm a Texan. I thought I'd uh, go ahead and accept that responsibility <laughs> and tell you, uh, remind you of the famous uh, John Steinbeck quote, who when he talked about Montana. Montana. So this is Steinbeck, not me. Montana seems to me to be what a small boy would think Texas is like from hearing from Texans. <laughs> <laughs> so that's who, uh, and I, as a fifth generation Texan, that's exactly right. <laughs> so I'm just so happy to be here and uh, just wanted to first uh, give a little shout out to those folks who organized this conference. I know these things are hard to pull off, um, even when you have a great topic and a great uh, um, location when you try to get a bunch of people that have busy schedules, which all the people in renewable energies do, as well as a federal, some federal people here and some state people and some local people. They've done an amazing job and just wanted to really uh, say thank you to the folks from NCAT and the other folks who sponsored this event. And um, I, I know there's folks from the Department of Agriculture here in Montana and from the other federal agencies. I think you have the Director of Agriculture who I haven't had the pleasure of meeting yet. Uh, here and just uh, really welcoming you from uh, Secretary Bill Sack, who I represent. Um, just wanted to take an opportunity today to, to take a few moments to acknowledge all of you that are doing this great work here in the room. You kept a uh, slow and steady drumbeat long before the words renewable energy ever entered into the, the sound bite that we hear today. All of most of the folks in, here in the room already get it, they get what we're trying to do. So that's why I know our time here today is gonna to bring out about some good things, and I know your week will, just by the booth representation and the folks in the attendee list. It sounds like, and it seems to me like, we have all the right people in the room. I'm in such an enviable position, I get to travel all over the country on behalf of the Secretary and the Obama administration to talk about things like economic development. I was talking about economic development when I was five years old, I grew up in a big family at the time. Kids, economic development with us, trying to make sure the family ate and, <laughs> and had enough to, uh, we didn't have a farm, we were just uh, poor kids growing up in rural Texas where everybody worked at a very early age and some of those jobs were working for farmers. So I know what it's like growing up in a rural town where you're trying to rub two sticks together and make sure that they amount to something so you can make sure your town survives. I know what it's like being in a family where there weren't any resources, and I know what it's like trying to start a company in rural America. Let me tell you, it's tough, it's tough. When I started a company in rural America, I still remember bankers across the table saying, I'll invest in you, Lillian, but I need you to move to Dallas. Nobody knows where Little Elm, Texas is. What, what, is, what are those attributes that make me wanna put my money in a town where nobody knows where it is, where you don't have the resources, where they don't think we had, where they didn't think we had the access to customers, and then and now I double down on rural America every day of the week. And those of here in the room that care about rural America, as I know you do, we're the fortunate ones. We're the ones with the true opportunity to make sure that the rural part of this country stays vibrant and real. With my travel, I've seen some spectacular sights and met some of the hardest working people in the country in rural. And I spent time in Montana earlier this past year, which I was so lucky to do in Bozeman. I have family friends from Missoula, longtime family friends that grew up along the river. And when I look at the big sky country and the wonderful <coughs> photograph taken by one of our staff of the Missouri River near Fort Benton, I'm reminded of what's really at stake here. I'm reminded that what we do now to keep renewable energy and the idea of renewable energy and the future of renewable energy in the forefront of all of our consciousness is not just talk, not, it's also about the way we walk, but our implications and how it affects the rest of the generations will be felt forever. We're so very blessed to grow up in a country where we do have the opportunity to change our destiny. And with the, the challenges faced by us, with the climate instability and climate change, or however you want to call it, what we do know is we do want to be on the right side of history. 
what I do also know is that rural econ those rural economies and those folks in rural America, they will be the ones solving this challenge. What we do in small towns, nobody else can do. We know that when there's somebody in a small town that has an idea, and when there's farmers involved, and when there's ranchers involved, something's going to happen. So when we're sitting here with this huge, huge challenge at our footsteps of how to make it so this planet is available for the next generation, generation, it really is going to require all of our hands. And most of you know that or you wouldn't be here. To see so many of you aligning your vision and your considerable horsepower and forgive upon your energy on a goal no less lofty than helping secure the future of the planet for our children and our grandchildren and beyond, it's, it's, just, it's an amazing opportunity. And I'm really hopeful. But I'm only hopeful because of the people that I meet in rooms like this that occupy the rural part of our country where I know the solutions are going to come. So what I'd like to share today is really a message of hope. As I look across the room, we see friendly, diverse faces, and I see that diversity of people who, you know, it's not about politics. It's about reality. Among us are federal and state employees, ranging from USDA to the National Park Service, folks from the Department of Agriculture, from the Montana Department of Environmental Quality and the NRCS, and the state's uh, Department of Agriculture, and business people, and there's some educators, and certainly entrepreneurs and scientists. We represent all of those folks in rural America that make this country great, our communities, our tribes, our nation. We have a real opportunity to tap into our diversity, to champion stronger support, and make no mistake, we all know this is going to be an all-hands effort. I know I'm lar largely preaching to the choir here. After all, you probably wouldn't be here if you didn't already understand that there's some, some challenge with <coughs> climate change. But let's have a look at some st statistics. And I'm a little passionate about this. I'm passionate about it in my early life, but I'm passionate about it now. And Maybe it's because I was in D.C. when the Pope came last week and talked about climate change. Just happened to have the honor of... Uh, being in the at the being 25,000 other people at the uh, parade when when he talked about the the challenges of the climate change, but when I look at the statistics, uh, according to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, globally the 10 warmest years on record all have occurred in the last 17 years. Last year was the hottest year on record ever, and this year is on track to break that record. Severe weather incidents, upheavals like Superstorm Sandy and Hurricane Isaac, extreme drought and heat waves, and the prevalence of devastating wildfires here in the West all are on an upsurge. In 2012 alone, climate and weather disasters cost the United States more than $100 billion. But for me, it's more personal than that. My stepson flies an F-18. He defends our country, graduated from the Naval Academy, and when he flies and has to go get on an aircraft barrier, I think, what for? A lot of that's about oil. And when he comes home, I know his, him and his little family are safe, but I think about as the world gets more complicated, if we're not fossil fuel independent, we're always going to have to have kids like him out there protecting us cost just the lives, the cost to taxpayers, the cost to what are we doing if we can make these solutions in our own backyard. And it's not just the material stuff or the personal stuff, it's more of the gut-riching effects of climate change, like asthma, food, water, and insect-borne disease. Those things that create a public health threat of special significance to the most, most vulnerable among us, like our children, our aged, and the poor. And what's the biggest driver of climate change? Carbon pollution. That's the reason your work in renewable energy is so crucial. Climate scientists warn that we must, not should, must quickly prevent a two degree temperature increase in order to ward off what they claim are going to be cataclysmic, potentially irreversible damage. I think everyone in this room understands that the clock is ticking we have so much work to do. And I want to focus on what we 
a little piece that we have something to do with, with the federal government, the piece that I work for, the USDA, what we're trying to do to move the needle, because I also want to know if there's something else you need, I'll go back and tell them. In April, Secretary Vilsack announced building blocks for climate smart agricultural and forestry. This is a forward-looking plan which features 10 building blocks that span a range of technologies and practices to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. USDA strategy focuses on climate smart practices for working production systems, voluntary and incentive-based plan, which provides multiple economic and environmental benefits, including resilience to weather, reducing emissions, and increasing carbon storage for farmers, ranchers, and forest landowners. It's through these initiatives that USDA supports the President's Action Plan, which seeks to reduce net emissions and enhance carbon sequestration by more than 120 million metric tons of CO2 per year by 2025. That's the equivalent of taking 25 million cars off the road or reducing the emissions produced by powering nearly 11 million homes. Now let's return to you here. Rural America is both a gem of opportunity and an engine of economic growth, offering loads of advantages when it comes to the important L's like land, labor, logistics, leverage, and of course leadership. What we at USDA know is we can't move the lever for all of US industry, of course not all of industry in the world, but we can have a very good influence on the control of the agricultural piece, which is a significant piece. Our mission is to encourage, to grow thriving, self-sustaining communities. And we believe that renewable energy and the bioeconomy offer a perfect fit for rural communities, for job creation and retention, for reshoring and manufacturing, and being the heart and soul of this movement. Putting our money at work to those folks who participate in our programs and help rural America's ability to survive and thrive is what we should be doing. But make no mistake, all jobs in rural America, whether it's one job or two jobs, they all matter to the growth of the rural economy. And we think that the renewable energy piece is part of the solution. You know the value far exceeds the obvious. We also think that there's some intrinsic yard sticks that are much more difficult to quantify, much more important to the people, not statistics, but the ability to raise their families in rural America. Some of the good news that I'm hoping to go over today, and we have folks here from the Rural Development Office here from the state of Montana here in the room, a very good presence, is some of the expanded energy title that was awarded to, to us in the Farm Bill in 2014, which was designed to help farmers and ranchers and small businesses, rural small businesses, to implement renewable energy efficiencies and improvements as well as systems. This Rural Energy for America, or REAP program, was designed to help develop and support a broad range of renewable energy, and it really touches everything on the farm and ranch, from grain dryers to solars, to from wind to woody, bath, woody biomass. Some of our large-scale anaerobic digesters produce so much electricity, it runs the whole farm and pushes power back onto the grid. REAP means job and economic, jobs and economic development. REAP encourages energy security and environmental stewardship. REAP fosters new jobs. Right here in Montana, nearly three quarters of a million dollars in REAP grants were provided this year alone, just through our REAP program. One of those projects located on the border of the Northern Cheyenne Indian Reservation, the owners of the Battle Cattle Company, Bailey Battle Company, are using their nearly $2,400 grant to replace gas-powered livestock well pumps with silver. This small ranch will save more than $1,000 a year in fuel costs. And solar also means freedom for the ranch hand who used to have to drive out to start up the pump every day. We have many examples of great opportunities that folks in Montana have taken, taken advantage of. I'm pleased to report that a growing number of REAP success stories, small and large, from the left, from the west coast to the right, to the east coast, are showing amazing successes and largely in testament to the all hands good work carried out by folks like you who across the nation but what we do have that we need help with is we have under the farm bill a nearly 200 million dollar authority 
to increase opportunities for farmers and small business folks to take advantage of energy efficiencies and improvements through a loan guarantee program. It's some of the best money in the, in the federal government. So think about this for a moment. Properly leveraged with other match components, by the time the next farm bill rolls around, our program could be well over a billion dollars. Right now we've been granted $200 million authority for this program. And while there's grants still accessible, we have a, a, a climate where you know, it's just harder and harder for the government to give out grants. The government really is in a uh, way that they look at awarding money is to make sure it's leveraged against other private sector resources. So the grant space will continue to shrink and we really are looking at ways to make sure that folks that are in the field, because we need more people talking about it, are aware of all of our resources so they can be utilized. So we'd like it if the folks in this room would just expand our, your vision to include our REAP Guaranteed Loan Program. This is a guaranteed loan, which is a natural fit for renewable energy products, projects, and offers the cheapest commercial guaranteed loan rates in the market. It allows you to include local lenders. We have very few lenders that know about this program because it was just uh, introduced and given mandatory funds in February of this year. I'm here to tell you it's very underutilized, meaning if Montana lenders, including credit unions, start using it, they could be um, using, have many more <laughs> projects than they had ever been envisioned. We only have a certain number of field staff. We've asked our, I met with the uh, head of the Farm Service Agency uh, yesterday afternoon before I left Washington to make sure that all of our farm service agents also are promoting the energy uh, loan program. But it takes us a long time to get that information into the communities, and we really need folks like you to tell lenders about it. And it makes sense for lenders, local lenders, so that that money stays in these communities. It would help with community buy-in into renewables if they hear it from local lenders. We really do need you as our boots in the ground to tell people that these programs exist. And it's true that success breeds success. As developers, you can change the face of commercial credit access for projects just by being your usual persistent selves, talking to customers, educating and selling and advocating these kind of programs. By involving local lenders, installing a successful project and then highlighting local benefits in conjunction with your lending partners, it's a win for everyone. These guaranteed loans are designed to mitigate lender risk, so that lender uh, has a government guarantee before they ever have to, uh, if something does go wrong, before they have to uh, you know, pay up. This increased competition among lend lenders ultimately means better rates and terms for borrowers. So we hope you help take commercial financing to the next level. As I work on behalf of the Secretary to, invest, to address climate change and, and economic development in rural America, I'm really happy to know that we have partners like you in the, in the rural areas of this country. I'm convinced we can reverse the trend and move our planet back towards health. And I'm totally convinced. And I, don't, I didn't grow up in a family that was an environmental family. I grew up in a small Texas town. But seeing what I've seen now and the kind of motivation that people have in rural America, I'm convinced that fostering the growth of renewable energy and the technologies that will come out of farm, from farmers will be the fulcrum and the turning point upon which many of us are depending on. And because of you, really, I have hope. So let's get to work. Thank you so much.